Part 1. He Joins the Packet Service. A short account of the life of Samuel Kelly, whose days have been few and evil, to which is added remarks, etc., on places he visited during his pilgrimage in this wilderness. Perhaps it may not be amiss to give some account of my family first. My grandfather on my father's side was a surgeon in the army and settled at Burr, Kings County, Ireland. My father, Michael, had first a commission in the army, but turning out gay, he sold his commission and went into the navy and was with Captain, afterwards Lord Rodney, in either the Tartar or Fame frigates when he engaged a French ship. He afterwards left the navy and went into the merchant service and I have heard that while sailing somewhere, that during his watch below asleep in moderate weather, every one of the men on deck was missing. But what became of them no one could tell, whether taken out by another ship or fell overboard. He was after this in the smuggling trade from Jamaica to the Spanish main, and was taken by the Spaniards and sent to the silver mines in Mexico, from which, by the assistance of an Irish priest, he escaped and fled to the Indians, I think he fastened the sentinel in a hammock where he had fallen asleep, and after suffering much amongst the Indians, he escaped in a boat, and after many trials arrived at Jamaica. Here he married at Kingston one Mary Thomas, with whom he got considerable property, but his wife did not live many years after. He then was master of a ship called the General Wolf, which was wrecked in St. Ives Bay, Cornwall. Whilst master of some ship previous to this, he beat off a French privateer, for which he had won a sword presented to him by one of the governors in the West Indies. My mother was the youngest daughter, and was courted by my father when wrecked near St. Ives. Before they were married, my father returned to Jamaica to collect his property, and was on his return again shipwrecked and uninsured. My parents were married about five years before they had a child, and then I was the first, born in June, 1764, at St. Ives. And before I was seven years of age, my mother had seven children, and then, with the seventh, died at Falmouth, from which place my father traded to South Carolina in the ship Admiral Spry. Four of my sisters died in infancy. On the death of my mother, my brother John, thirteen months younger than me, and myself were sent to board at Helston with an aunt about the year 1771, where we continued at school till 1778, except one voyage I made to Charleston with my father in 1774 for the benefit of my health, after having scarlet fever. There, I often viewed the colonists trained to arms to resist the encroachments of the parent government, which terminated after a long, unhappy war in their independence. The ship was here laden with rice for Falmouth, and on her arrival, I returned again to school. During my voyage, I was treated by my father with so much tenderness and indulged with so much fruit, nuts, etc., and brought home such a number of birds that caused me to wish to be placed at sea when I left school, though I had suffered severely from seasickness. All the time we were at Helston, we associated with the most respectable and orderly boys and lived in a family of the strictest morality. About the beginning of the year 1778, my father married his third wife, Nancy Mitchell, of Penzance, and I believe both parties expected each other to have handsome property, which was not the case, and my stepmother, being rather advanced in years, died with the first child, and the infant followed her in a few days. Previous to her death, I was removed from school and placed in the Tyne packet, Captain Robert Johnston, bound to Madeira, the Leeward Islands, and Jamaica. She carried fourteen guns and sixty men and boys, and in order to induce the captain to treat me well, I was to have no wages. I was also placed in the mess of the mate and second mate at my father's expense. Notwithstanding all these precautions, I may date the beginning of the troubles of my life from this period. The night before the ship sailed I slept on board, but as there was not sufficient room in the place allotted for the men to sling a hammock for each, I had to spread my mattress on a chest. Soon afterwards, a drunken boatswain's mate took possession of my bed and left me to shift for myself. We then sailed, and I became seasick, which continued some weeks, and for more than seven years I was less or more troubled with this sickness on leaving the harbors and also in contrary fresh gales when the ship plunged in a head sea. After leaving Falmouth, my messmates took little care of me. 
I slept, or rather lay about, upon the deck, in holes and corners, being unable to eat, or scarcely crawl, my chest of clothes was thrown down the main hatchway, having no one to look after it, and for want of exertion by the sickness I became dirty, and literally a neglected castaway. At length the sailing master, Samson Hall, afterwards some years commander of an East Indianman from London, took pity on me, and ordered a hammock to be prepared and slung across under the clues of the seamen's hammocks, and though this was a third ship's, and not very comfortable, I had here some peace in the night. But the quartermasters, finding it in the way of their mess, it was thrown aside in the daytime, and I was therefore obliged to lay on the chests when it was my watch below. Mr. Hall was a severe man. I was happy to be taken some notice of, and he commonly made me hold his quadrant from past eleven till the sun was near the meridian, by which I learnt to take the sun's altitude, and from this time I acted as a midshipman on the quarter-deck. A few days after leaving soundings we fell in with a fleet bound to the westward under convoy of the Hussar and Montreal frigates. I was placed in the second mate's watch, and was stationed in the afterguard, and as I often fell asleep at night on deck, my messmate, the second mate, used repeatedly to drench me with water, sometimes thrown only in my face, but at other times my clothes were wet through, which made me cold and uncomfortable during the remainder of the watch. One cold night I crept into the cabin stairs to shelter myself from the winds, but Mr. Hall, coming up to see the weather, detected me, and ordered the officer of the watch to place me on the poop, in the most exposed situation by way of punishment. Sometimes my face was tarred and blackened when I fell asleep on deck. On our arrival at Madeira, the captain indulged me so far as to permit me to accompany him and the passengers on shore to see the town, which I found very pleasant and gratifying. Here we landed a Negro boy, Marcus, whom Mr. Hall had purchased on the last voyage to the West Indies for Mr. Bell, the postmaster here, as a livery servant. On our quitting this anchorage, we saluted with our great guns some gentlemen who had come on board to take their leave of the passengers, and in order to make me a warrior, the captain appointed me to fire the guns on one side. Nothing of moment transpired from our quitting Madeira till the day of crossing the tropics, when preparations were made, as usual, for shaving and ducking those seamen and boys that had never before been this voyage. Accordingly, about twenty or thirty men and boys were confined below, and the hatchways closed and guarded. After putting a half-crown in my pocket, which was the fine to escape the ducking, I pushed forward to get it over as soon as possible, and afterwards to enjoy the sport with the crew. Accordingly, after one or two had been shaved, I presented myself at the hatchways when my eyes were closed with a wet cloth or stocking bound round my head. I was then conducted and placed on the edge of a large tub of water, but escaped with a little wetting on the captain's interference. I had then an opportunity of inspecting the actors and process. Two seamen, representing Neptune and an attendant, disfigured with blacking, flour, and an odd kind of dress, were the shavers. The lather was composed of tar, grease, etc., and the razor, an old iron hoop jagged at the edge like a saw, and what was scraped off the face with this vile instrument was drawn between the teeth, and the person opened his mouth being blinded. They then threw him on his back into the tub of water, while many other seamen poured buckets of water on his face till he had nearly lost his breath, and thus ended the shaving. I also saw the captain's steward ducked from the main yard arm three times while the ship was running six or seven miles an hour he being obstinate and refusing to pay the fine. But it was an unwarrantable proceeding, and attended with great danger, as the ship was rolling very much. On our arrival at Barbados, we found laying in the bay His Majesty's ship Boyne and Prince of Wales, of seventy-four guns each, with many frigates and sloops, Admiral Barrington having his flag hoisted in the Boyne. Here we learnt that Dominica had been taken by the French, for which island we had an engineer on board, at this place, one of our seamen, taking the advantage of my simplicity, borrowed a great part of my pocket money under false pretenses, and on his going on shore on liberty, never returned to the ship. This was a great disappointment to me, as I had little left to purchase fruit. After waiting here a few days, we left Carlisle Bay, and proceeded to Grand Corland Bay in Tobago. In this anchorage we discovered a number of pelicans, some of which we shot, 
they settle in a shoal of small fish, which they catch under the water in their large bill, with a bag or loose skin hanging under. And as they raise their head to swallow the fish, a number of small seagulls are ready to pluck it out of their mouths. Therefore, it is only now and then they have an opportunity of securing their prey. From hence we proceeded to Granada, St. Vincent's, Montserrat, Antigua, St. Christopher's, and lastly to Kingston, Jamaica. As we passed Port Royal, we found the flag to be Sir Peter Parker's in the ruby, my father having furnished me with a letter of introduction to his friend, Mr. Daniel Gully, a shipbuilder here, I was kindly received and entertained at his house whenever I had liberty to go on shore. He also took me in his kitterine to see another of my father's old friends. And when I sailed, he sent by me the hire of some Negroes, which my father had left under his care, together with a present of coffee, cocoa, nuts, and a case of old rum for my father. We sailed from Jamaica under convoy, and on our arrival at Falmouth, I hastened on shore to see my father, and on my return to the ship, found to my great mortification that the officers of the customs had seized and carried off my case of rum together with some coconuts. This first voyage being concluded, and my father disapproving the usage I had received, removed me to the King George packet, Captain Wacop of 14 guns for Lisbon. In his ship I continued two voyages, but the treatment I here received was also rough, with this difference, that I was now better able to take care of myself. In my watch I was stationed in the tops, and was trained to the exercise of small arms as a marine, and to frequent boxing bouts with other boys. I had a letter of introduction from my father to the mercantile house of Caffrey and Tibbs of Lisbon, with whom I dined when on shore, and saw on Sunday the celebrated bullfight, when about fifteen or twenty bulls were fought with men and dogs. Only one bull at a time was introduced into the amphitheater where a one horseman and two or three footmen stood prepared to attack the bulls. The horsemen used a long spear, and the footmen used short darts with pieces of colored flags on their arms to irritate the bull. If the bull refused to attack the men, one or two dogs were let loose on him, and once I saw the bull jump in among the spectators, over the enclosure about five feet high. I saw also one of the combatants so hard pushed by a bull that he threw himself between the horns of the animal and held fast round his neck till several men disengaged him from his perilous situation. Soon after my arrival home, after the second voyage to Lisbon, my stepmother and infant died, and as my father was low-spirited, I stayed at home a few weeks and then shipped myself once more in the Tyne, Captain Robert Johnston, bound to the Leeward Islands and Jamaica. I continued two or three voyages in this vessel during the years 1780 and 1781. On my revisiting Madeira, I was employed to carry the letter bag on shore, and on my being discovered at the postmaster's door by Marcus, the Guinea Negro boy mentioned in my first voyage, he was overjoyed to see me, and took me to a confectioner's and laid out some money in cakes for my use. He then conducted me to several houses where he was acquainted, to introduce me as his old acquaintance, and conducted me into a sick English gentleman's bedchamber, under a supposition, as I would imagine, that as we were countrymen, the interview would be gratifying to both parties. He also introduced me to a man-cook in Mr. Bell's kitchen, where I dined with them, and after showing me every civility, I returned to the ship well pleased with the gratitude of this poor African, who probably recollected that I had often given him a piece of gingerbread cake. After the hurricane in Barbados, I was much surprised on my arrival to behold such an alteration in the appearance of Bridgetown. Almost all the coconut trees which were formerly interspersed through the town had made a lively appearance, were now no more. The church, a brick building, was blown down, and the fort and town much damaged. On our arrival at St. Kitts, the beach presented a melancholy prospect, there being a number of vessels of various descriptions lying about, irrevocably wrecked. We lay two or three days in Grasselet Bay, St. Lucia, with Sir George B. Rodney's fleet, repairing their damages after an action with the French. When we lay at Port Royal, Jamaica, our vessel became very leaky, and heaving in the hold where the water came in, we heeled the ship and found a rat had eaten through the side at the water's edge. Was it not for a superintending providence, how few seamen would be spared to old age, considering the perils they go through? I well remember at this time being in our cutler sailing from Kingston to Port Royal, 
when the step of the foremast gave way and the mast went through the bottom of the boat. We immediately took in the sail and put a jacket or trousers in the hole and began bailing out the water till the frigate's launch came to our relief and towed us alongside our ship. In this ship I was stationed when at sea in the main top, and I imagine I have slept hundreds of hours in this top, even when the ship has been rolling nearly gunwale in, and often pitching with very sudden jerks against a head sea. But through mercy, I was never thrown out of the top, and the pillow I made use of was a small box of gunpowder, deposited there for the hanker buses and blunder buses in case of engaging the enemy. This dangerous box generally served as a pillow even in thunder and lightning, which is very frequent in squalls and warm climates. The greatest trouble I had in this top was attending the sails that were hoisted on a long top gallant mast full thirty feet in the hoist, and on this mast I was obliged to haul myself up by main strength with my hands. When all the sails were set, to take in and out and send into the top, the upper sail, which was termed in this ship a skyscraper, was not only a very painful and teasing employment, but also very dangerous, as this mast used to bend and spring like a coachman's whip. There were lying at Port Royal, under the command of Admiral Sir Peter Parker, eight two-deckers and several frigates and sloops of war. I saw two seamen flogged through this fleet for desertion, a most cruel punishment, especially as the desertion is sometimes occasioned by severe and cruel treatment. These men were fixed to a kind of gallows in a boat, and exposed to a tropical sun whilst going through their punishment, and I was informed one of the men expired on the same day. I think on the last voyage I was on this ship, while we were at Montserrat, I perceived the silver coin current there to be very black, and on inquiring was informed it was owing to the steam of sulfur issuing from an old volcano in this island. From Antigua we carried General Burt to St. Christopher's. He was the Governor General of four islands, and on his leaving this ship we saluted him with fifteen guns, which was returned by the forts on shore with seventeen guns. On my return to Falmouth, being much attached to the sailing master, Mr. C. Spurrier, who had taken me under his protection to instruct me in navigation, and who employed me to sell his adventures on shore in the islands, on his leaving the Tyne I also quitted her and we both shipped ourselves in the Greenville, Captain James Nankaville, a contract packet, three of which were provided by a Captain Steward of Milor, under contract with the post office. In this ship we sailed for the Leeward Islands, the 20th of October, 1781. Previous to this date, I was a voyage in this ship in company with the Dashwood for Charleston and Roebuck for Jamaica, it being usual for several packets to sail at the same time for mutual defense in case of an attack while crossing the Bay of Biscay. Our vessel, Spanish-built, was the fastest sailor off the wind, but a most miserable tool in plying to windward. We could spare the dashwood seven sails more than we had set, and even then was the headmost ship. As she had the mail for the Canary Islands, we parted with the dashwood off Madeira, having escaped from a fleet of seven sail, which chased us to the eastward of Porto Santo. Between Madeira and Barbados, the Roebuck always in company, we were often chased by cruisers, without effect, and arrived at Barbados the 21st of November, 1781. The 26th, the Cork fleet arrived consisting of 72 vessels, under convoy of the St. Alban of 64 guns and a frigate, and as these were expected, we could sell little of our adventures, which most of the crews of the packets are accustomed to trade in. The Grosselet schooner brought our dispatches from St. Lucia, and we were ordered to sail that evening for England. During this passage we had very turbulent weather, and while scudding under a foresail, our vessel broached too, which caused us to be in imminent danger of being swallowed up in the waves, then running mountains high. While scudding, our velocity was ten miles an hour. When we lay the ship to, she proved one of the best sea boats I was ever in, for though the sea was grown very high, and the waves very turbulent, our deck was as dry as if the weather had been fine. She was short to her breadth and very high, which occasioned her to carry her guns well out of the water. Our complement was fourteen fourteen-pounders and two eighteen-pound cannonades and sixty men. If you've enjoyed hearing the story of Samuel Kelly from his journal, please like, subscribe, and follow on whatever platform you're listening. 
Be sure to check out other ways you can support this project and others in the description. And catch the next episode to hear more about Samuel Kelly's adventures as an 18th century sailor.